green Paradise is the place we need I feel the peace, feel the peace inside of me Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown coming to you with another episode of Interfaith Issues. Today we're going to continue the discussion of doctrinal differences between Christianity and Islam and how we rectify those differences. And the topic of discussion today is the Trinity. Now, to begin with, it's helpful if we look at the Christian sources and what they say about this concept of the Trinity. The New Westminster Dictionary of the Bible states, quote, the word does not occur in scripture, referring to the word Trinity. Quote, the word does not occur in scripture. According to the HarperCollins Encyclopedia of the Bible, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity as such is not revealed in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. That's the HarperCollins Encyclopedia of the Bible. The doctrine of the Trinity as such is not revealed in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. Well, this makes us wonder, if the word Trinity does not exist in the Bible, and if the doctrine is not revealed in the Bible, where did it come from? And why do so many people believe in it? And that is something we really have to explore. Now, the concept of the Trinity was actually derived by Tertullian, a lawyer in Carthage around the year 220 CE. Tertullian came up with the concept of the co-sharing of divinity between God as the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. It has to be pointed out this concept was derived 220 years after the, the calendar started, after the zero point of the calendar. Now, the mission of Jesus Christ was roughly from the year 34 through the year 37, roughly. So this means that the concept of the Trinity was derived a little bit less than 200 years after the mission of Jesus Christ. That's a long time. That's 200 years of other Christians never having even heard of the concept. It is no surprise then to find that early Christianity was at odds over the concept of the Trinity. Some people proposed it, other sects of Christianity vehemently denied it. And so you had early Christian sects who followed the unity of God as taught by Jesus Christ, and you had others trying to trying to work the Trinity into the established church doctrine. According to Hans Kung, one of the leading theologians of this time, quote, throughout the New Testament, whereas there is belief in God the Father, in Jesus the Son, and in God's Holy Spirit, there is no doctrine of one God in three persons three modes of being, no doctrine of a triune God, a trinity. Bluntly put, according to Harper's Bible Dictionary, quote, the formal doctrine of the trinity, as it was defined by the great church councils of the fourth and fifth centuries, is not to be found in the New Testament. Harper's Bible Dictionary. This is concerning, especially when we find such comments as, quote, the Trinitarian formula was shaped in a highly complex, sometimes contradictory, and at all times wearisome process of thought. Again, that is from Hans Kung. Now, I think most people know that the Nicene Creed was put forth at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. We find this comment, quote, a profession of faith agreed upon, although with some misgivings, because of its non-biblical terminology, 
by the bishops of Nicaea to defend the true faith against Arianism. A number of very important points in this quotation. Number one, the profession of faith, the Nicene Creed, was arrived at with some misgivings. They weren't sure about it. Why? Because of its non-biblical terminology. It's not mentioned in the Bible. The concept of the Trinity was derived by extra-biblical terminology. Which means what? Which means a bunch of people came up with the concept not based on what we find in the Bible, but because they proposed it, they liked it, they ratified it. The other thing that is important to learn from this quotation is that the bishops of Nicaea derived the Trinity to defend their faith against Arianism. This is a very important point. Arius was the bishop who put forth the teachings contrary to the Trinity. He was the one who said, well, if God is the Father and Jesus is the Son, there must have been a time when the Father preceded the Son. So they cannot have been co-eternal. How can the Son be co-eternal if he comes from the Father? There must have been a time when the Father predated the Son. Arius argued for Unitarian belief, the belief in God as one God and only God as one God, as Jesus Christ himself professed. Three places in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is asked about the greatest commandment, and his reply is, No, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Nowhere is the Trinity elaborated, as you understand from the quotes I have already read. Now, why did all of this happen? Why did the world of Christianity feel a need to unite upon one of these creeds? On one hand, you had Arius with his Unitarian Christianity and the other bishops and, and priests who followed Arian Christianity. On the other hand, you had the Trinitarian proposal. What was the need to resolve this? What was the need to unify the Christians under one belief? Well, the need was that the emperor of Rome at that time, Emperor Constantine, saw the Roman Empire torn apart from within by religious infighting. Now, at the same time, the Roman Empire was waging wars on a number of different fronts. And the fact of the matter was that the empire was crumbling. It could not withstand the forces of being torn apart, both on multiple war fronts and being torn apart within by religious fractionation. So the driving force was that Emperor Constantine basically forced his empire to be united under one religion. And it just so happens that Trinitarianism became prevalent not by theology, but by force. Now, we find that it is interesting to note that although Trinitarian Christianity was established during the time of Constantine, at least for some time, it did not remain established. Meaning what? Meaning this. Constantine died. He left behind two sons, Constans and Constantius. Now, Constans was the stronger of the two. He ruled one half of the empire, whereas Constantius ruled the other half. Constans imposed his will, imposed the Trinitarian Church upon the entire empire. So, the empire was converted to Trinitarian thought during the time of Constantine. Constantine died. His son, Constans, imposed Trinitarian belief upon his brother, Constantius, who was an Arian. But guess who died first? That's right, Constans. As soon as Constans died, Constantius took over and imposed Arian, Unitarian Christianity, upon the empire. So we're back to Unitarian Christianity. But it doesn't end there. After Constantius died, we have Julian assuming the throne. Julian tried to return the Roman Empire to the paganism it had practiced before. He didn't succeed. 
because he didn't live for very long. When he passed, his sons took over, and again, they were divided. One ruled one half of the empire under Trinitarian Christianity. Valens ruled the other half of the empire under Arian Christianity. It wasn't until their passing that Trinitarian Christianity became uh, firmly established and it remained the what was considered the Orthodox Christianity of the realm. But the point is that it had a fluctuating history. It was not agreed upon unanimously. Now the Nicene Creed was rendered authoritative at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, and after that, it became considered authoritative. It, however, arrived at this state in such a convoluted manner than, that we find comments such as the following. From the New Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, it is difficult in the second half of the 20th century to offer a clear, objective, and straightforward account of the revelation, doctrinal evolution, and theological elaboration of the mystery of the Trinity. Trinitarian discussion, Roman Catholic, as well as other, presents a somewhat unsteady silhouette. And with that thought, we're going to take a break. Please stay with us. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown, continuing this episode of Interfaith Issues. We are talking about the Trinity and the unsteady silhouette by which it derived its, its being. According to the quote that I just read before the break, and I will repeat it, from the New Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, Trinitarian discussion, Roman Catholic as well as other, presents a somewhat unsteady silhouette. Well, unsteady indeed. Why? Because, quote, the formula itself does not reflect the immediate consciousness of the period of origins. Now, isn't that a comforting thought? To know that Trinitarian Christianity is following a formula that does not represent the consciousness of the period of origins. In other words, it doesn't represent the teachings of Jesus Christ, the disciples, the early Christians. But to continue, the formula itself does not reflect the immediate consciousness of the period of origins. It was the product of three centuries of doctrinal development. It is this contemporary return to the sources that is ultimately responsible for the unsteady silhouette. In other words, everything would have been fine it would have, the Trinity would have looked fine and been easy to explain except for the one problem of the fact that it did not agree with early Christianity. It did not agree with the teachings of Jesus Christ. This is what led to the unsteady silhouette. As if that is not enough, the New Catholic Encyclopedia continues as follows. Question. The formulation, one God and three persons, was not solidly established, certainly not fully assimilated into Christian life and its profession of faith prior to the end of the fourth century. Wow! We are saying it took three to four hundred years. We had to step three hundred to four hundred years away from the period of origins before the Trinity not only could be derived, but implemented into Christian faith. But, to return to the quote, but it is precisely this formulation that has first claim to the title, the Trinitarian dogma. Amongst the apostolic fathers, there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a mentality or perspective. It's hard to think of what to say beyond that. We have the New Catholic Encyclopedia admitting that it took three to four hundred years to derive the doctrine, admitting that, quote, among the apostolic fathers there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a mentality or perspective, but that is the creed that they stick to nonetheless. Well, if we sit back and we ask ourselves, where is there a religion 
that follows what Jesus Christ himself actually professed. Where is there a religion that did not go through the theological gymnastics to take three to four hundred years to derive a doctrine that was unknown to the apostolic fathers? Where is there a religion that follows the monotheism that Jesus Christ professed when he said, Know, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one? Well, if you answered Islam, you would be correct. Let me quote from the Holy Quran, quote, O people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of Allah anything but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah and his word, which he bestowed on Mary and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers. Do not say Trinity. Desist. It will be better for you. For Allah is one God. Glory be to him. Far exalted is he above having a son. To him belong all things in the heavens and on earth. And enough is Allah as a disposer of affairs. In the Holy Quran, Allah also warns, quote, O people of the book, Exceed not in your religion the bounds of what is proper trespassing beyond the truth, nor follow the vain desires of people who went wrong in times gone by, who misled many and strayed themselves from the even way. We may want to delve into the issue further. There are pages and pages in which we can look into the matter. We can quote other scholars. Bart D. Ehrman, in his comments on the teachings of Paul, quote, in particular, the adoptionists considered Paul one of the most prominent authors of our New Testament to be an arch heretic rather than an apostle. We can quote Joel Carmichael, quote, we are a universe away from Jesus. If Jesus came only to fulfill the law and the prophets, if he thought that not an iota, not a dot would pass from the law, that the cardinal commandment was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and that no one was good but God, what would he have thought of Paul's handiwork? And let us remember that it was Paul who spoke the words or proposed the ideology that the Pauline theologians grabbed a hold of and converted to the Trinitarian formula. In the words of two famous authors, to begin with, in the words of Dr. Johannes Weiss, quote, hence the faith in Christ, as held by the primitive churches and by Paul, was something new in comparison with the preaching of Jesus. It was a new type of religion. And if I have not shown anything else, it is exactly that. What Jesus Christ professed, the oneness of God, what early Christians believed, the oneness of God, what the apostolic fathers believed, the oneness of God was not the formula that was later derived by the Christian Church to become the Trinitarian formula. Bajent and Lee summarize the situation as follows. This is a rather long quote, but I feel I cannot say it better. Quote, in all the vicissitudes that follow, it must be emphasized that Paul is, in effect, the first Christian heretic, and that his teachings, which became the foundation of later Christianity, are a flagrant deviation from the original or pure form extolled by the leadership. Eisenman has demonstrated that James emerges as the custodian of the original body of teachings, the exponent of doctrinal purity and rigorous adherence to the law. The last thing he would have had in mind was founding a new religion. Paul is doing precisely that. Which theology won the day? I think we all know. In this time, the Trinitarian Church is predominant over the Christian world. We do find Unitarian churches, but they are very much in the minority. 
When we approach the Trinitarian and ask them for evidence, where's the evidence for the concept of the Trinity? The one piece of evidence they always hold up is the first epistle of John 5, 7 through 8. It is in this passage where it is quoted as mentioning the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. I will quote exactly, to be precise, quote, for there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Sounds good? One problem. It's not in Scripture. It's in the translation. The interpreter's Bible states, this verse in the King James Version is to be rejected. It appears in no ancient Greek manuscript, nor is it cited by any Greek father. Dr. Schofield, in his Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible, states, it is generally agreed that this verse has no manuscript authority and has been inserted. Multiple other scholars say the same. Professor Metzger, that these words are spurious and have no right to stand in the New Testament is certain. How did it come into being? The Johannine comma, as it is known, 1 John 5, 7 through 8, was written into the margin of scripture by a scribe. Somebody liked it, they took it from the margin, they put it into the text, and it carried on from there. But now, with the honesty of modern scholarship, we know that this was an insertion by a scribe, and it did not exist in the original scripture. Hence the reason why Christian scholars themselves are calling for it to be rejected. Hence the reason why it has been removed or modified in the Revised Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, the New American Standard Bible, the Good News Bible, the New English Bible, the Jerusalem Bible, Darby's New Translation, and the list goes on. Honest Christian scholarship has recognized that this verse does not stand up to critical analysis. There are other pieces of evidence which are held up as weaker elements of support. I would just say that in the same manner that I have presented refutation for the evidence that the, the church presents otherwise, they all have their answers. I would invite anybody watching who wants to learn those answers and learn more about this subject, please go to my website, www leveltruth.com, that's L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H dot com. You will find my books, Misguided, Godded, other articles and unpublished chapters. You will find everything that I have said and a great deal more on the subject. But for now, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown concluding this episode of Interfaith Issues. Looking forward to the next time we meet. Hope to see you then. Best wishes and peace. I feel the peace, I feel the peace inside, of me. inside of me, a complete tranquility. I remember Allah.